Go to Genesis chapter 1, all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And I want to preach on the subject of, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Let's read together. In the beginning, God. Can you say that with me? In the beginning, God. Created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said. Say that. God said. Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that... It was good. Somebody say, it was good. It was good. Say it like you mean it. It was good. It was good. <laughs> and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. Now, I read to you the first five verses. I could have easily read the entire first chapter, but for the sake of time, it is the chapter in the Bible of the creation. It is the book of Genesis, which means beginning, or uh, when it started, when it commenced. And so uh, that is the story of the creation, and it is powerful and it's fascinating. How many have read the first chapter of Genesis. Tells them, great, great, almost everybody in here. And it tells how God created. Now that word is, we sometimes wrongly say that we created something. But this word means that from nothingness, God created something. He literally formed something, which makes no sense to me, in my human mind, out of nothing. Out of the nothingness, he created life and he created uh, all of creation that we know and that we don't know. You see, only God can do that. Genesis, if you look at the book, answers a lot of life questions. When did it all start? How did it happen? How did we get here today? And where are we headed? What is the plan for our lives? And how do I fit into this grand story of God's creation and his love for mankind? You see, Genesis is the book of beginnings. How many like beginnings? Amen? Beginnings are exciting. Uh, nothing bad has happened. Uh, it's the, the beginning. It, it's excitement and, and, and there's energy and there's passion. Uh, it's about the beginning. And people need to understand that there was a beginning yeah, yeah. and God made the Amen. beginning. They need to understand that because people these days are being told that there was a big bang and Pretty much nothingness collided with nothingness and created a big bang, which doesn't make any sense. And they're being told that you came from nothing, you're going to amount to nothing, and therefore there's no reason to hope. No reason. And there is a, a transcending message in the book of Genesis of hope. Yes, you see, we need to understand and we need to be, look at your neighbor and say, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> If people hear long enough that they came from nothing and they will be nothing, then they will believe it and begin to act in that manner. Genesis, the book of beginnings. And at the beginning, it sets the stage for the entire Bible. And it reveals the person of God and how we fit into God's plan. How many knows that, that God had just created and, and say, there you go, do what you can do. God created a plan along with creation. Genesis establishes the value of human life. When it says in chapter 1, verse 27, that we were created in God's image 
and in his likeness. You see, this world wants to tell you, and this world system wants you to think that you are not valuable, that you have no place, that you are no good, uh, but I want you to know that you have value because you were created in God's image, and if he took the time to stoop down and to gather the dirt and the clay and to make man that he loves you and he thinks you're valuable. Look at your neighbor and poke him and say, God loves me. I started to say, tell him God loves me better than you, but that's not right. So not only does it give us the story of the creation of mankind, but it also tells us of the fall of man. The original sin, and because of sin, the separation that occurred because of sin. And Genesis even foretells of the redemptive plan yeah. of God. That there will come a time when the seed of the woman will crush yeah. the head of Satan. Yeah. Yeah. And if so there is a time when God says here in Genesis that he will redeem mankind unto him. Yeah. And so we need to understand the beginning. We need to understand where it all started. How many like me have ever been curious and picked up a book and started reading in the middle? Yeah. Man, nobody. Come on now. Tell me. All right, I see a few. How many have ever picked up a book and read the last chapter? Now, I, I, I know I've heard too many people say, okay, okay. You see, just this past week, I began reading my Bible over. Now, I'm not on a a, a, a pattern of reading the Bible from January 1st to December 31st because I, I just read it at the pace that, that, that I can. And I look at this and I began reading Genesis again this week. Somebody say it's the beginning. It's, the beginning. it's a new day. It's a plan. A, a new beginning. And as I looked at this, I wondered how many of us Christians are guilty of fast forwarding and just understanding the middle of the story. Yep. We love, we, we, we gathered last week to talk about Jesus being on the cross, yes. to talk about how he was crucified, to talk about how he bled and died, to talk about how he uh, rose from the grave on the third day, and we get all excited. But many people do not understand the beginning. <coughs> Therefore, there's no foundation. No setting to truly understand the depth and the magnitude of what Jesus did for us. You, you see, you need to understand the beginning. You, you need to, uh, how many of you want to just get dropped into the middle of a class uh-uh, I haven't taken algebra in a while. If they dropped me in the middle of that class, I'd be lost. Come on. I'd have to start at the beginning. I wonder how many of us are guilty of only thinking about, only telling people about the beginning. The mid I mean the middle of the story. No background. No understanding of the significance of the creation. And of God's original plan for man. And I tell you, this is a great place to tell you that you need to be in a discipleship class. Right. You need to be in Sunday school. You need to be uh, on Wednesday night or a small group or something. Because this is simply the dessert portion. I get excited, I get you excited, so that we have all that energy and we go out and we tell the world about Jesus and about God and what he's done for us. But if we don't know the beginning and all we can tell people about is what Jesus did on the cross, they don't understand why man even needs a Savior because mankind sinned. We see that in the book of Genesis. The book of beginnings. The book of where it all started. What does Genesis tell us? It tells us that there is a God. In the beginning, God. It, it tells us that 
there is a God, that he does exist, that we are not an accident, but God was there in all of his glory before any of this began. Those of you who knew my pastor, Brother McKinley, would know that his favorite verse was Hebrews 11.6. <coughs> and he would start in the middle of that verse and he would say, I am persuaded that God is. You see, you first have to know that God is. And that God is a rewarder of those who will diligently seek him. I, I love how people just, they, they understand that verse. But first, you see, we didn't know how profound that Brother McKinley was in saying that we must first be persuaded that God is. The devil wants to tell you that this all happened, it was crazy, there was some big bang. There was. There's a big bang. God said, let there be light. Boom! And there was light. But it didn't happen like they talk about. You, you see, we must understand that there is a God. Somebody say, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And God created all that we see and all that we don't see. The heavens, the earth, everything in it. God is created. Somebody say, God is. And God is powerful. Not only did he create the world, but he created mankind in his own likeness. We did not evolve. We did not come from a monkey. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. And because God is, and he is creative, then he is distinct from man. We cannot become God. Only God is God. And because he's God and he created us and he created all that we see and all that we know, then he has authority over all of us. And he has control. Now, that's where it gets interesting. In Genesis, the devil convinced Adam and Eve that they didn't need God. That they could be their own God. That they could rule their own life. And that's where it gets really bad. Because they needed to understand that God is. We can't take the place of God. We're not like God. Uh, in the fashion of that we were created. We're in his likeness. But we don't have all the characteristics of God. That's right. Somebody say God is. God is. God is. God is. The earth. And all of creation and all of mankind was not happenstance. It did not happen accidentally. God does things in order and he does it in perfect timing. Can I get an amen? amen. And it was an intentional decision, not a reaction. It was an intentional decision, the action of God to create mankind. That means personally that you were not an accident. No matter what someone may tell you, uh, no matter how you feel about yourself, you were divinely and intentionally conceived in the mind of God. He knew you before you were created in the womb. And he purchased, he, he purposed that you would be alive today, sitting in this service, here today, hearing this message, to know that God is, and he's a rewarder of those that will diligently seek him. To know that God is. What a hopeless situation if there is no God. What a desperate, dark, terrible time if there is no God. Not only does the Bible teach us that God created and he created man, but that he takes an active role in the lives of his creation. And he has been fashioning, I want you to hear this. God has been fashioning you and forming you and maturing you to be what he called you to be all along. You are a thought in his mind and God said, I will create this yeah. one. Yes. You're uniquely skilled and talented and have a 
abilities that the master himself put into you. And you're valuable to the kingdom of God. Now, let's look at Genesis from a view a little farther away. The view that it, as an overlapping and overarching theme of hope. Look at this story in the first five verses. When God created, he, it was a process. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm in process. I'm in process. That's right. You're not complete. And the world, when God started, was not complete. The Bible tells us that it was formless, that it was void, that it was full of darkness. I like to look up words because I don't think that I know the depth of the meaning many, many times. And I looked up those words without form in the original language, and it says this, a state of confusion. An empty place, a place of chaos and obscurity. From this empty, void place of, of chaos, God began to move. That, ooh, that ought to excite you. Yeah. Hey, anybody here that can associate with an empty, void place in your life, whenever it felt like that nothing was going right, it felt like all was dark, it felt like all was good, you had almost given hope that God takes a situation like that and it begins to work, a work in you, and it is a process. And God ain't finished with you yet. I know that's bad English, but God's not done with you yet, and he's still working a work. Your neighbor again and say, I'm a process. I'm in process. You see, there's no situation too bleak, too dark, too barren, or too void, or too hopeless, put that up, for God to make something miraculous out of it. If He took the nothingness and the blackness and the darkness that was there before creation, and he made a beautiful world out of it. Just don't, 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 don't tell me that he can't do the same thing in your life. Yeah, that's right. you, you're simple. You're easy. Uh, God can just change it all around. And he only has to speak one time. And it will turn it all around. It will turn it all around. How many need God to speak into their life today? See, no matter how dark, how scary, how impossible it may seem, God, seem, God has a plan for your life. On a little bit further, the text says that the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. The message says this, that God's Spirit brooded like a mother bird above it. How many can see that picture? This mother bird. Brooding above what God was getting ready to do. And the Spirit is hovering over you because God has such a great and mighty plan for your life that he's not going to let the devil come in. He's not going to let the devil uh, 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 forfeit your, your destiny. And the Spirit of God hovers over you like a mother bird. How I many have you ever seen a mother bird? Have you ever tried to knock a nest down? Oh, she don't like it. Can I tell you that the devil is not going to knock you out of the destiny that God has called you to? He's not, he's not going to do that. In the original language, language moved upon the waters is almost poetic. I love it. It says that the breath of God moves softly or fluttered over. The picture of a mother bird. Not only is she not going to let anything happen to the baby bird, but she's not going to be mean to it, not going to peck it, going to softly flutter above it <coughs> to protect. God is doing something so great and so mighty 
then his spirit flutters above. And that word goes on to say that it is a feeling of love. Wow. God's motivation to create is based on love. He loves you so much. And when we love, as humans, we procreate. Our love for our spouse is so great that we want to express a love that will <coughs> cause children to come. And that's what God does in us. He creates something in us because he has such a great love for us. And he sees that we have great potential. How many knows that we see great potential in our children? Yeah. And God sees that. And God, like that spirit that moved upon the waters, he's always moving. We may not understand it all the time. He's working in the background, in the, in the, uh, uh, the recesses of our lives sometimes to bring hope when all seems hopeless. <coughs> Love motivates God. Mm -hmm. Imagine. As God speaks and the universe comes into existence, all chaos yields to order, <laughs> emptiness begins to fill with light, and light eclipses the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> all because God spoke. <laughs> we need God. Fill us with his life yes. and to make us even more like him Amen. in his image. Yeah. Wow. God declared that there would be light. That's what that word says. He declared it. He commanded it to appear. What does God want to declare over your life? Hear me. What does he want to declare? Hear the Spirit. Many times we ignore the voice of God. Right. What does he want to declare over your life? The introduction of light turned it all around. And that literal light, it was literal light, but it was also symbolic of the grace and the presence of God in a world that was full of sin and darkness. And I challenge you, you can look at the Bible from that point on as God bringing light into darkness throughout the entire Bible. Hope into hopelessness. The answer to darkness is still God's light. The answer to sin is still the light of the gospel. Our God is still a God. He did not stop after creation. Isaiah 43, 19 tells us, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. When God starts moving, expect what you think is impossible to happen. The reason why the wilderness is called the wilderness is because there's not much way to get out of it. The reason why the desert's called a desert, called a desert, is because there's no water. But here it says he'll make a way, and he'll have rivers. <coughs> it's not too late. Your situation has not dried up too far that God cannot produce life yeah. and light and the river of the Holy Spirit move. How many want that today? Amen. How many just need a new start today? I, I feel that uh, God wants to do the impossible. As a matter of fact, I would be so bold as to say that God delights in making the impossible possible. And he loves to start with nothingness and create somethingness. 
I don't even know if that's a word, but I can tell you that uh, my computer didn't kick it out. God likes to start with nothingness and create something. <coughs> something of value. Something of substance. Never think that I am just going to exist. That I was just called to exist. No, no, no. God called you for a purpose and a plan. And he called you to be a soul winner and he called you to be victorious because uh, of him you can be victorious. Never think that you're too small, that you're too young, that you're too old. God called me to this ministry when I was 43 years old. Oh, I had been teaching and I had been doing a little bit of preaching and leading worship. But this call to pastor this church came at a point in my life when everybody would say, he's pretty much set. He's got a great career at Sylvania. He's doing well for God's sakes. I want to do something. Something you never imagined. Something that you thought was impossible. Something you thought was too great to happen. Because God loves to take a mess and make it a message. And he likes to take a test and make it a testimony. Can I get an amen? amen. So what does God want to create in you? Teresa, would you come to the piano? What does he want to create in you? What does he want to create in this church? What does he want to create in your family? What does God want to create in your marriage? God is a creative God. And with him, all things. You don't know my family history. You don't know my situation. You, you don't understand my finances, Pastor. You don't, I, I don't even have any education, Pastor. You, you don't understand. God will take, if he will take void and dark and chaos like he did a creation, then he'll take your life and he'll flip it and he'll turn it around and he'll speak light into your life and he'll make a way where the seeds to be. Bible tells us, and this just came to me, so this is Holy Spirit speaking, that all of creation is waiting for the children of God, for the children of God to come alive. Now, it doesn't say it exactly like that, but it says that, that, he, that, that all of creation groans and are wanting the children of God to come to that level that God's created them to be. When God created light, and he says it repeatedly, he said, it was good. It was good. God wants to create something good in you. And this morning, all of us are in different states of our life. You may or may not be walking in alignment with God. You could, have, you could be a Christian, but have wandered far away from the intended destiny that God created for you. But it's not too late. God desires to do a wonderful, creative work in your life. And it starts with obedience. It starts with yielding to Him. Hearing His voice and saying, yes, I agree. Amen, Father. Too many times we go, oh, I can't do that. But God wants us to agree with the Spirit this morning. Why did God create all that he created? Because he loves and he desired to have a fellowship with his children. And he took the ultimate step 
when mankind said he came in the person of his son. God came in the person of Jesus so that we can know the God that created the universe in a very personal way. Aren't you thankful for that? Imagine this God that spoke in all of the universes, all of the galaxies, all of the moons, all of the everything that, and, and all the people and all of the things that we don't even know about yet. God spoke all of that into existence, but yet he sent his only son hmm, that we could have a relationship with that God. Wow. Aren't you thankful? That, my dear friends, is the beginning. But let's don't stay at the beginning. Let's walk with God. 